This is Kentucky Afield Radio. This is Ron Rohde, Kentucky Afield's first host back in 1953. Now, I'm proud to present Charlie Baglin. A special show today for anyone who likes to hunt and fish. Why? Because March 1st is a day that should be circled on your calendar. In big red letters, write, Buy My New License. We go inside outdoors today to take a look at what that means. License options for fishing, hunting, trapping, for you, for visitors from out of state, anyone who hears the woods and waters calling. Lend an ear. Next on Kentucky Field Radio. Boys, we're in trouble. A true story. And it sunk right out from under us. Perfect for duck hunting, but not for a swim in the middle of a river. My hands were so cold in a matter of seconds that I couldn't pop the clip on my waders to get them off. There's no time to react when your world just sinks out from under you. Three hunters, two survivors, one reason. Your life jacket's got your back. Your Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife reminds you, your life jacket's got your back. And the backing of sportsmen on winter water everywhere. I fell to enter the elk draw last year, and all I've done is whine. So, how are those New Year's resolutions? Remember those? Here's one you can finish today. Registering for the Kentucky Elk Hunt. The Kentucky Fish and Wildlife Elk Draw website is the one and only place you can register for once-in-a-lifetime excitement. fw.ky.gov It's the easy resolution fw.ky.gov Welcome to Kentucky Field Radio. My name is Charlie Baglin. You know, we get a rush looking at the calendar and realizing there's a new year in front of us. A clean slate. What will it bring? What adventures await? March 1 begins a new year. If you're among the one in four Kentuckians who hunt or fish, there is a promising new year in the offing. And if you're not, that's okay. That smaller 25% still helps you, too. We hear the term wildlife management. Then we go, hmm, nature's nature. Nobody assigns the tree to bear fruit. Nobody schedules the leaves to turn red in the fall. Nature does this on its own. So what's really being managed? Well, since people came into the mix a couple of hundred years ago in the droves that we did and the balance of them, one with the other, got out of whack. We build subdivisions in their woods. Animals simply can't adapt as quickly as we think they can. During the period of westward expansion, woods, waters, rivers, dams, farmlands, there were wholesale changes that came upon the landscape. And animals are still shaking their heads. The effort in place to keep a finger on the pulse of this is what we call wildlife management. And true, we don't really manage the animals. What we manage are ourselves. We manage people to the benefit of animal populations. And those who own the fingers are the 25%. And those 25% are a wonderful thing. And the most important thing they do before they bring home that big buck in November or that big mess of fish for the church picnic is to buy a hunting, or a fishing license. Collectively, those few dollars fund the science behind the seasons. Trout, rabbit, deer, whatever it is. In an effort to keep the whole outdoors as balanced as possible. The better the funding, the better the outcome. So just buying a license, even if you never use it, helps. And March 1st, begins a new year, a new license year, meaning it's time to renew your hunting or your fishing license, and then let the dreams begin. In the studio with me are Brian Clark, a wildlife biologist and assistant director for the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife, the Public Affairs Division, and Captain Richard Skaggs, conservation officer. And this hour, we're going to talk about the variety of licenses that are available to Kentucky residents, for our out-of-state visitors, for kids, for the military, and any exemptions that may apply. So, gentlemen, welcome and Happy New Year. Thank you. Same to you. March 1st, sort of an odd time to be talking about New Year's, but if you have a hunting or a fishing license coming on March 1st, you need a new one. 
because the old one's going to expire. It's not just fishing license since it's spring. You better think about your whole year and you, you, you look to different prices and what what you anticipate you're going to do. That's a great so. idea. That's a great point because if you anticipate hunting in the year, like uh, Officer Skaggs said, Captain Skaggs, if you, if you want to uh, hunt later on, you'd be better off to purchase a combination license, hunting yeah. and fishing, or a sportsman's license, which incorporates a lot of different hunting and fishing opportunities. We have a ton, 37 or something like Do you, you know how many? I don't know exactly, but that sounds like a good, good estimate. When you take in hunting, fishing, permits, federal, state, resident, non-resident, I mean, it really adds up. And you could commercial... Licenses uh, and, uh, you know, even uh, dog training areas. I mean, we've got a lot of permits that they're there for a specific reason. I would like to take this hour to go over all of them that we can. I want to try to hit them all. Is there a situation, first of all, where somebody doesn't need a license? If you're under 16, you're not required to have a fishing license, and that is under 16, 16 and over has to have them. Is that in every case, if a non-resident, somebody comes down from Indiana, yep. up from Tennessee, wants to fish here, under 16? Yeah, non-resident especially. Someone under 16, still living at home and is a dependent child, would not be required to have a license because landowners and their spouses and dependent children hunting or fishing on farmlands that they own uh, are not required to have a license. And that includes a tenant who... It says resides and works on that property. So a tenant, it's on the land they're on and the contiguous land. It's not because they rent off John Doe and John Doe owns another farm 100 miles away. No. That doesn't. I got you. That doesn't. But now it covers John Doe's wife and children who are dependent children. Could someone from Missouri just sort of blow in here and fish to their heart's content? Yeah. Without a license? Yeah. Under if they're six, under 16? Yeah, fish. Mm-hmm. Under 16. Okay. Mm-hmm. And to clarify, the folks, youths that are under 16, if they're 12 to 15, they are required to have a hunting license if they're hunting. Okay. So we do have a difference in hunting and fishing requirements in terms of age there. So there is, there is a discounted youth license available to youths who are 12 to 15 that are required to have a license, for example, if they're hunting on property other than what their family owns. If you are under 12, do you need a license to hunt? No. So someone could come in here from Mississippi and visit their uncle or or whatever Mm -hmm. and not need? Yes. It's available for everyone. It's mostly Kentuckians that take advantage of that. But nonetheless, uh, we want to encourage participation in hunting, fishing, and wildlife recreation. And so, yeah, we make that opportunity available to uh, youth from, from anywhere. So then it come in from a foreign country, Canada, doesn't matter. Yes, that's okay. good. So we're talking about people, first off, who don't need licenses. Now, and I want to mention before we go on on exemption, servicemen who are on furlough for three or more days are not required to have a hunting or fishing license, non-resident or resident. And they may decide to go hunt or fish while they're here. So just know that servicemen on furlough for three or more days are not required to have a license. Servicemen who are signed here and are not on furlough but are on active duty, they can buy a resident license even though they're from another state. So if a soldier's assigned to Knox and he's from Wyoming, he can buy a resident license. If you're participating in a department-sanctioned field trial event, which is mostly for people that own beagles, bird dogs, things like that, and if they're participating in a, in a field trial type event sanctioned, then they would not be required to buy a license. What happened to the 65-year-old clause? This has been gone now how many years? Since 90. Seven, I believe. Yeah. So since 1997, if you're over 65, you used to be license exempt. Now you're not? No, you're not. You used to get a lifetime license, and then we transitioned to a $5 license at that time. So everyone uh, has to have a license unless they're exempt. That includes disabled people can also get that $5 uh, license It's called now the Senior Disabled License. 
Technically, they're, they're separate, two different licenses, but they essentially function the same way. It's like a sportsman's license with many permits included, hunting, fishing licenses, and then also the trout permit, migratory bird permit, deer, turkey permits, and so on. It's about $150 value. So it's got hunting license, fishing license, trout permit, migratory bird and waterfowl permit, deer permit, turkey permit, and then, of course, it includes all the the other hunting small game for statewide area. deer permit yes it doesn't include the bonus tags though statewide deer permit right. does not include federal waterfowl stamp federal waterfowl can you fish for trout with it yes trout permit ducks or geese they would need a federal duck stamp so what's in your pocket more on kentucky's hunting and fishing licenses we got to get to a break you're listening to kentucky a field radio Listening to Kentucky Field Radio. We're back in our second segment. My name is Charlie Baglin. Do you plan on doing a little fishing this year? Maybe this is your year to take up fly fishing. Maybe you have friends coming in to visit from out of town. You're going to head to the lake. Kids can swim. Others try to hook a few bass. Haven't fished in a while. Where to buy that license? What's it cost now? Well, that's what we're here to talk about today. In the studio with me are experts from the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife. To my left is Brian Clark. He is the Deputy Chief of the Public Affairs Division, along with Conservation Officer Captain Richard Skaggs. And, Captain, let me ask you now, why do I, anybody, need a license to begin with? Well, not only because it's a statute and regulation, but because it supports conservation in the Commonwealth of Kentucky and abroad. Because the federal waterfowl stamp, you know, right. helps the federal program. So it helps with the ecology of the wildlife, but also the ecology of the social system of being able to fund all these things. If you want to, if you want to hunt and fish in modern times, it has to be managed, and in order to be managed, it has to be funded. And so this model is the most successful of probably any government agency. This is uh, Fish and Wildlife Agencies have been doing the user pays model uh, for what, 70 years? Or, or am I, I'm no, you're right. That. Yeah, approaching 80. Right? Yeah, yeah, that's right, over 75 years. So it's a, it's, it's a successful government program that benefits Everyone, and it, and that's why we always advertise that sportsmen pay for conservation. Everybody enjoys, a lot of people enjoy the outdoors, hiking, bird watching, all the different things. But now hunters and fishermen and boaters, they pay to maintain the outdoors and healthy animal populations. And so when you buy these licenses, you're not only just paying a, some government fee, you're taking care of what you do. So so we're talking about programs such as habitat enrichment, surveys to know populations of various animals, for mm-hmm. example, deer and turkey, rabbits, for example. You pay for wildlife biologists in the woods and the waters. Exactly. You pay for public lands and waters, access to those in terms of boat ramps, um, parking lots on wildlife areas for people to be able to go and recreate. Fish habitat improvement, major projects, cave run, putting all kinds of habitat out there. You know, fish and wildlife, you're investing in not only maintaining, but we're constantly expanding opportunities. Yeah. And really, this is the good old days of hunting and fishing. Now, of course, you know, we're always working on some projects. We'd like to have more grouse. We'd like to have more quail. We'd like to have more rabbits. But that's not really... That's a habitat issue and a availability issue. It's not an issue that can't uh, be overcome. You know, it's not like a disease or problem or something like that that's a, the main barrier. But uh, this is the good old days of hunting and fishing because people have paid these fees. And you, you've got opportunities that you wouldn't even thought about 30 years ago or 40 years ago. The deer population, for example, in the 70s, most people... They didn't have a word. <laughs> there weren't any. The county. I'm originally from Ellick County, and I, you know, we we harvested uh, probably the first year I deer hunted. I think there was 30 deer harvesting the whole county. So, mm. and now you know it's harvesting up up to 450 a year, and that has to do with the stocking programs. 
that we did. So absolutely, yeah. and fish stocking. We stock millions of fish every year in Kentucky. So the, these populations, many are self-sustaining. Others, because of the volume and intensity of recreation that we exert on those resources, require constant restoration. So we have fish stocking, for example, in addition to species that we're able to restore and then manage through regulations on harvest and uh, access and things like that, we're able to manage a sustainable population without augmentation, without adding to them. So there's a combination there. But in any case, licenses directly support these efforts. Somebody out there is going to be saying, my sales taxes, the taxes I pay, pay for all these things. And what's your answer to that? No, we, we receive not a single dollar from the state's general fund, so we're not tax-supported. We're funded by user fees, primarily license and permit fees, and then also grants that come to the states through excise taxes on essentially hunting and fishing equipment. That's a big word. Yes. That's a federal type of tax that manufacturers themselves pay for fuels, archery equipment, hunting equipment, fishing line. Right. All those kinds of things. Yeah, fishing equipment, hunting equipment, shooting equipment, and then, as you mentioned, motorboat fuel. All those have a surcharge or an excise tax on them that uh, that goes into a pool of money nationally, and that money then is granted out to the states based on land area in the state and also hunting and fishing licenses sold. Uh, I guess it would be a good time to talk about matching dollars. So when you, sure. when you put in your $20, for your fishing license. That's not just $20 coming back to your state. We're going to get that matched through federal funds through uh, Pittman Robertson and Dingle Johnson, the two for hunting and fishing type stuff. But anyway, we will get matching funds back to the state. When federal. It does. Yeah, from federal government. So the more people we can get hunting and fishing, the more dollars we get back from the from yeah, federal the, government. The bean counters of fish and wildlife are always at odds with folks like us who want to say, well, how much? Because it, it sort of varies on how many licenses are sold. But, for example, if you buy spent $20 on a fishing license, would Kentucky itself, the Department of Fish and Wildlife, get back $21? Would they get back 40 What do you think it's closer to? Yeah, so on average, like in 2012, it, it does vary, Charlie. It's an excellent point. Year to year, it depends on number of licenses sold, not only in Kentucky, but also in other states. And then also the, the funding that's available in any given year. So in some years, for example, when we have, as we have in recent years, a high volume of firearm sales, that means additional money that goes into that pool of funds from the excise taxes on manufacture of firearms. And similarly, if there was a you know a, um, a large volume of fishing equipment sold any given period, a year or two, or for a stretch of time, that would add additional funds in that pool of money, and so that's therefore money more money that could come to the states. But in 2012, we had it was about six dollars for each fishing license sold that came to Kentucky and then in federal funds or grant funds and then about around ten dollars for each hunting license sold and that's because again there's a different amount of money that comes in based on hunting equipment or hunting and shooting equipment and then fishing equipment so it gives you an idea of a significant uh, return for us in federal grant dollars that we use our, those state license dollars to match. No, oh, and you say six dollars for every twenty that's better than a 25 percent return that is, is good it is good and then for uh the funds that are available we get a 75 percent federal rate of reimbursement so for we can take a one license dollar and get three federal dollars back for all the eligible money that that we can put forward uh we can't take every license dollar that we get and obtain those federal funds back you know three to one but we uh for eligible funds, we're able to bring back a significant amount. And so the license dollars are really vital for us in terms of being able to multiply our efforts and the investment that sportsmen make to get more money into, into the resources and recreational opportunities we have here in Kentucky. So the show is about licenses, and you need one as of March 1st if you want to hunt and fish or trap legally in the state of Kentucky. What do you say to the folks, Captain Skaggs, when they say, well, I haven't bought mine yet? Or, well, no, I don't live here, but uh, my uncle does. I come to visit him a lot. Or I went to college here. Or I really like this state and I like to visit and so money talks. Does any of that carry any weight 
The simple answer is no. Everyone should know that you're required to have a license to hunt or fish. It's that way in all 50 states. So if you knowingly are fishing and you have the rod in your hand and you're doing it, then there's not much excuse. When I ask you for a fishing license, or one of the officers asks you for a fishing license, that, that's kind of one of those things that are yes or no. If you're standing there trying to catch fish, I, there's just not much excuse. Now, if you're in your home farm pond, you're not going to see us <laughs> because that's we're not interested in that. But uh, if you're on public waterways, you, you should anticipate that the conservation officer or game warden is going to check your fishing license, and it's the same way with hunting. And you need to realize that other states are going to enforce their laws as far as residence, residency requirements, and if you're a non-resident <clears throat> and you own land here, you're still required to have a hunting license, fishing license on your property. You know, we get some excuses. You know, my uncle owns this, and they, mm-hmm. I was just going to do it for a day. And well, I understand that, but I have a license for you if you want to just do it for a day. I've got a one-day fishing line. I've got a one-day hunting license. We cover anything that you might want to do, and we've been, a, you know, it's as accommodating as possible. You know, I used to. We we kind of, you know, you paid a big fee for a non-resident license, and that's the way it was. Now we give you a one-day and a seven-day, and you know, you can you can pick the amount of time that you want to do it but uh, no there's not a lot of excuses not to have the proper license and that and you you know we, we publish hunting and fishing guides and you basically order what you want when you go to a vendor you go online or you go on the telephone there's a list of it there for you and whatever you're going to do you need to need to purchase that license gentlemen we need to stop there music is playing that means a break our fishing report is just ahead up next I'm going to ask the captain for some of the best excuses he's heard lately. (laughs) He's got a big grin on his face. I love a good excuse. Don't go away. This is Kentucky Field Radio. Bagman back in our second half hour. We have a fishing report standing by. If you would like to hear this show again or any show that we've ever done, they are pretty easily found. You can go to our YouTube channel and just put Kentucky Afield Radio, and man, up will pop a list, and you can search right through and find whatever you would like. If you want this show, go to our Facebook page. Get in the search box, put Kentucky Field Radio. You can like us right there and keep up with what's going on each week on the show. You'll find the weekly link. You can share that via email or on your Facebook page. It's as easy as that. More on the licenses you will need for a great year of hunting and fishing. First up, our fishing report. <laughs> Jeff Crosby with the Central Fisheries District Fishing Report. It's that time of year to complete those last minute odds and ends of maintenance to your fishing equipment and to your boats. That a fishing season will soon be upon us in the next couple of weeks. Currently, Sauger beginning to stage below many of our locks and dams on the Ohio and Kentucky rivers. Live minnows, jigs, spoons, or small crankbaits can be used to catch a few of these fish. Always beware of the possible dangerous water conditions when fishing at these areas. Additionally, it's a great time of year to catch a few trout. Trout are being stocked in streams such as West Hickman Creek and Veterans Park in Lexington, Harrington Lake Tailwaters, and many ponds and lakes that are part of the department's Fishing and Neighborhoods Program or the Fence Program. So grab a pole and enjoy some great fishing. Hope to see you on the water. This is Kevin Fry with your Eastern Area Fisheries Report. Rainbow trout stockings occurred recently at Paintsville Lake and Martin County Lake at Milo. Catches of fish are good and fish hold well for good fishing opportunities through April and May. Recent rainfall has been keeping high water flows in the tailwaters and mostly turbid to muddy water condition in the reservoirs. However, crappie anglers doing well around brush and fish trap lake around Hurricane and Up Lake. White bass also in the catch. A few walleye caught at Car Creek Lake and looking for this fishing to be good first half of March at both Car Creek and Paintsville Lakes. Good heavy largemouth bass coming from Paintsville, Yatesville, and Fish Trap Lakes and standing timber or brush. Jig spoons and crankbaits accounting for some nice fish over 20 inches. 
Hi, this is Eric Cummins with your Southwest Kentucky Fishing Report. Barren River Lake is on the decline. Clear water can be found in the lower half of the lake. White crappie have been found with good numbers and sizes fishing near channel or channel drop-offs. Bass have been fair on jigs, jerk baits, and tight wobble and crank baits. And Green River Lake muskie have been fair in the warmer water areas. Protected coves with feeder creek influence have been best. Bass have been best where you can find clear water plus rocky banks or the back ends of coves with feeder creek influence. Green River Lake tailwater have been good for walleye cropping catfish when discharge is lighter. If the flow is up, fish the backwater area across from the ramp. As always, good luck and good fishing. Be sure you wear your life jacket. Kentucky's Nature and Wildlife Fund. You see it as a contribution option when you prepare your state tax return. But you also see it as songbirds and wildflowers. You can see it in clear, flowing streams. Sometimes it's so secluded you may never see it at all. But if you only see it on your PC as you prepare your taxes, that's good too. Google it and see the difference this fund makes. Kentucky's Nature and Wildlife Fund. The natural tax shelter. Boys, we're in trouble. A true story. And it sunk right out from under us. Perfect for duck hunting, but not for a swim in the middle of a river. My hands were so cold that in a matter of seconds that I couldn't pop the clip on my waders to get them off. There's no time to react when your world just sinks out from under you. Three hunters, two survivors, one reason. Your life jacket's got your back. Your Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife reminds you, your life jacket's got your back. And the backing of sportsmen on winter water everywhere. We're back now on Kentucky Field Radio into our second half hour. My name is Charlie Baglin. Topic this hour, talking about a new year, the new license year. If you like to hunt or fish, March 1 begins your new license year. The hunting or fishing license you have had over the past several months has now expired. Having a license to do something is pretty special. A driver's license, of course, License to be a plumber, a medical license, business license. It means that you are legal, and it says to the world that you know what you're doing. You will proceed with some honor and ethics. Do you remember when you bought your first fishing license or hunting license? Probably you were 16 years old, as I was, and it signaled an entry into adulthood. I bought mine at the Carroll County Clerk's Office. 1976, I think it was five bucks back then, but there was never a prouder day. Didn't have my driver's license yet, but I had my fishing license. Buddy, I could flash that around. Today, the places you can buy them are as common as Coke machines. You see these yellow signs with the Fish and Wildlife seal. It says hunting and fishing licenses sold here. Plus, there's some other options. Brian, where are they? Well, you can purchase them at a point-of-sale vendor such as a local department store, sporting goods store, or corner market. Okay. You can purchase them through a, a telephone number that we publish in our hunting and fishing guides. And then you can also purchase from our website, which is fw.ky.gov. And it may be the simplest for folks to purchase there, whether they have Internet access at home or work or their library or whatever, because they can take their time, look through the offerings that are available to them, and then pick the ones that they want. And so you can purchase more at your leisure that way. I'd also make the plug that we we don't have to pay vendors for the licenses we sell if you purchase through our website. So we, we receive an increment higher uh, proportion of that funds and are able to put those dollars directly into the resource and the recreation opportunities that we provide. So uh, if you can visit us online, do that. Also, our elk hunt application entries are only sold online, and there are a few other opportunities such as uh, I think annual passes at Otter Creek, a few other things that are only available online at fw.ky.gov. So it's a great place to go and, and not only get the license and the permits that you need, but also find out where to go if you don't have a place to fish or hunt or whatever. Is this a paper license that you're required to have in your pocket? If you purchase by telephone, we will give you an authorization number, and then you need to carry identification with you Okay. To, for verification on that. And, and if you buy it online, you can print it out, a paper license, and there's also a number there. And then, of course, you can buy the traditional paper license. 
and, and fill it out. But this verification uh, of you kind of first need to know what you bought, and so you're doing what you said you're legal to do, mm-hmm. and you just write, have that somewhere on you. Could you it, take a picture of your license? Is that going to cut it? As long you as I got it on your phone, if I can verify, yes. If I can verify that you have a license, yes, that 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 will work. I would encourage people because I've seen people get in additional trouble. Don't try to use someone else's licenses. Don't give someone else your license because two people, you can both be in trouble. That's happened. I've been checking people and then have somebody else flip somebody a number, go around the front of the line, and then both of you can be in trouble. So, no, don't do that. You just need to play with the rules. But now, I understand we'll do everything we can to verify your license if you don't have it. You know, if you're helping children fish, don't worry about the game warden. If you know that you're just helping those kids, you're fine. But... If you're going to be doing the act yourself, then, you know, yeah. you need to purchase a license. You heard any good excuses uh, lately? I love a good excuse. Yeah. Then it's funny because everybody says, well, I know I bought those. And I've heard that since the mid-90s when I started this job. And, you, and we didn't have computers back then. It wasn't so easy yeah. to run those license numbers, you know. But people... The excuse is not caught up with technology because you've, if you tell me that now, I'll say, oh, okay, give me your name. And then I don't have bad radio communication, so someone can look it up for me. Or I can get right on my computer and I'll, I'll type it in and I'll know whether or not you have a license within, within a minute. Now, in the 90s, people would really beg on that and try to convince us we had one and verification was a little bit harder but we we tried to do it so the excuse hasn't caught up the technology but if you tell me you bought one you better be sure you have because i'm going to run it and i'll find out could i buy even though i'm a resident of kentucky could i buy an out-of-state license could i buy a non-resident well we try to put in provisions in the licensing system to help you avoid unnecessary mistakes or spending for things that you don't need to. For, so, for example, if you were to purchase with a KDSS vendor, one of our direct sell system vendors out in, at a local shop, or if you purchased online, you should get asked that question. You definitely will on our website, and then also with a telephone purchase. So you'll be asked whether you're a, yeah. a resident it, of It's Kentucky. easy to make a mistake if you're maybe in a hurry. Right. It's possible. You need to remember, though, that it's not the license vendor's responsibility. All right. What is a license vendor? This is the dude at Walmart. He's the gentleman that you tell him what you want, and he punches it in his his terminal, yeah. and then it prints it out. He knows how to do it, but he, he knows doesn't how. know all the specifics. And he he can't know what everybody's going to be doing. So, if you, you know, I'm just going deer hunting, but you don't tell him. That you're resident, non-resident, or and he's real right. busy. He could print you out the wrong thing, and it's not his responsibility to correct it. It's your responsibility to make sure that you that you order the right thing, and it'd be the same thing as if you did it online. So, so. if you call the Department of Fish and Wildlife, they will specifically ask you, and they do know exactly. Uh, they would say, "Are you intending to do this?" or Yes, yes. So the telephone number that we sell licenses through is actually a private vendor that we pay to do that that processing. We don't have the staffing to to be able to handle that volume. But there is a question, a prompt in that system, and there also is on our website. And usually the vendors, you know, they they try to help the customer in that regard. But as Captain Skaggs pointed out, People come and go in those retailers, and you might have someone working at a counter that is not familiar with licenses at all. And then again, to his point, they don't know what individual customer is going to be doing out there, and so they can't anticipate all the license or permit needs that you or I may have right. out there on the, in the field. The lady comes over from mixing paint. It says, this guy's on break, but I'll be glad to help you. What do you want? And you better know it behooves you to know in advance because she... She doesn't. Right. That's right. She doesn't. Exactly. We so, try to mitigate some of that. I mean, we combined the migratory bird and waterfowl permit. That was kind of a common mistake. Dove hunters, a lot of them don't hunt everything else, and they, they just dove hunted. They they get confused on what they needed, and they either, you know, forget. And now having that one combined, that's that helps. Bottom line, it's pretty straightforward. You know, I'm going fishing. Get a fishing license. Right. You, you you know, sit there and, and do the math. Most of our vendors have the hunting or fishing guide right there. Open it up. You'll find the menu of 
of what's there, and it's pretty self-explanatory. A while ago, we were talking about why do you need to buy a license? And you said, well, it helps the programs of the department. Now, that's not lost on people. They know that if they buy the light, that's where the Department of Fish and Wildlife gets its operating funds. Now, some disabled people, some senior citizens, are also quite aware of that. Maybe they like the, the idea of a free license, but they don't mind paying the money. And they don't mind paying full price. There are some folks out there that say, I know you do good work, and I appreciate it low these many years. I'm going to pay full price for my license. They may do that. They're, yes. can, they're not obligated to just spend the five. That's right. They can, they can buy the full license if they wish to. And we receive feedback from folks that do just that. They yeah. purchase the full price license to support what we do at a higher level of investment than just $5 a year. Yes. Licenses, annual fishing, joint husband and wife annual fishing, one day fishing, three year that's something new, isn't it, Brian? A three-year mm-hmm. resident fishing license for $55. That took effect in 2014. We've sold a few thousand of those. Yeah, so it's not been a hugely popular product, but we, we wanted to test the waters with that, so to speak. We wanted to see how many people would be interested in doing that. Some states have had really good success with multi-year licenses, and so this was our first offering with that. It's... Uh, still experimental at this point and it may be continued and we may promote it a lot more or it may be discontinued if it's not uh, participated in more. Captain, let me ask you this question. Uh, Captain Richards, you know, I was talking to Brian a while, uh, a few days ago, I said, before this program we were setting it up, I said, who would you recommend? He said, Ricky Skaggs would be good. And I said, yeah, Ricky, let's get him. I was taking the liberty of abbreviating <laughs> Richard, Richard's Skaggs? name too much. Were you ever with uh, Ricky Skaggs when you were little? Twice. You gotta remember, I'm from Elliott County, and he's from Lawrence County. He's from <laughs> he's from Blaine, and 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 we're we're all the same same set from about eighteen. Are you related to Ricky? Yes. Are you yeah. real? Yeah. Even if you're not, I'm gonna assume Eight, you. eighteen. 80-something is when the, the line split, but we share the same great-great-great-grandpa. Oh, That's it. Neat. <laughs> yeah, so for some reason, yeah, I had I am, Ricky in my mind. I am mountain folk, if you I, want to know. If you brought your banjo or mandolin, I would have you prove that. Yeah, and I can't sing either very well, so no, I did not get that trait. But okay. Well, Captain? The name only. Talking about boating and the calendar year, hunting, fishing, trapping licenses, right? Trapping is in that, too, that March 1st to the end of February. Yeah. When is the boating? Is there a boating year that also you need to re-register your boat on March 1st, or when is that? May 1. May 1st of each year. Through the end of the following April. Yes. Okay. That's because those are administered by, that registration is administered by the county clerks. Yeah. And, and so uh, it's a different system than ours. Yeah, the Department of Transportation actually handles your registration tags and all that. Yeah. Are there gray areas out there? Are there some honest mistakes made out there, Captain Skaggs, when you're in the field? Yes. Ah. So I am not always guilty as charged. We'll talk about those in our final few with the conservation officer. Stay where you are. You're listening to Kentucky Field Radio. We're back on Kentucky Field Radio. My name is Charlie Bagman. We're going to wrap up this New Year's show. March 1st is a New Year's Day at least as far as a million people around Kentucky are concerned, it begins a new year of hunting and fishing seasons. Another way to say it's time to buy your new hunting and fishing license. You know, far more people in Kentucky fish than they hunt. It's like two to one, maybe a little more than that, two and a half to one. reason is it's simple. It's easy. There are plenty of places to go. You can stop at the store and buy yourself a pole for cheap. Like 30 bucks and 30 minutes later, you're fishing. Brian Clark with the Fish and Wildlife Public Affairs Division and Conservation Officer Richard Skaggs are with me in the studio. Here's a fair question. Are the opportunities for residents in this state also available to non-residents? Virtually everything. Bears, I believe, may be the only thing currently that are only available to residents that are not for non-residents. For example, our youth 
opportunities. We have special youth weekends for turkey, for deer, waterfowl, and so on. Those are available to non-resident youths as well. If they are required to purchase a license during that youth weekend, they do have to purchase a non-resident equivalent or version, which is um, still greatly discounted, but slightly higher. It might be a dollar or a few dollars higher per license, but, uh, but those opportunities are still available to non-resident youths as well. Permits to get into specific hunting areas. There are three, right, in this state. Captain, if we wanted to go to Land Between the Lakes, uh, Otter Creek Outdoor Recreation Area, Peabody Wildlife Management Area. Yes. Before we close the show, let's talk about hunter education, because you're always going to be looking for that hunter education card. Yes. Tell me what you're finding. As far as compliance right. with it, uh, it, compliance is probably 90%. Or a little better. You know, I find it on the dove field quite a bit. Somebody picks up a gun, they were born after January 1st, 1975, and they just didn't go take the class and they didn't pick up that exemption. So that's that's a mistake that we find. So if you're born on or after January 1 of 75? Yes, you must take the, it must fulfill the hunter education requirement. Yes. So you're starting now to get to be middle age? Yes. So this isn't just for kids? No, so, no absolutely not. Yeah. So somebody born in 1977, eh, that doesn't apply to me, and it does. Yeah. We have our iPhones out, and That's we are right. doing the math on yeah. that one. Yeah, and we all might also throw in there, Charlie, a lot of folks have the misconception that we receive a real large percentage of our revenue. We make a lot of money, essentially, doing on, on fines, you know, on the officers out there levying oh. citations or tickets. And the reality is it's a tiny percentage of our income, our revenue. And so the officers, as Captain Skaggs pointed out earlier, they want people to comply or, or purchase that license and not get a citation gotcha. be, because we, we want folks to enjoy the resource. We want folks to, you know, contribute and support it because it benefits them. In fact, we use those funds not for, you know, salaries and that kind of thing. We use those for education. We use them for youth events, use them for educating people about compliance, about what licenses or, you know, what they pay for, and, and that's to help people to comply, help people to to uh, participate legally in the future, and so uh, just wanted to point that out. Yeah. I have heard rumors, that, and it, honest Brian, it didn't enter my mind, but I have heard rumors say it's the 29th of the month, and there's going to be more tickets written than in any other time because you got to make budget. <laughs> <laughs> that's Absolute, not the case. Absolutely not. With the correct. game warden. No, absolutely not correct. And I would say that's oh. I'm my intent. My feeling is that's not the case anyway with any law enforcement any place. No, it's it's not. And there's no quota systems. Quotas are illegal anyway. But that's that would be counterproductive for us. We don't want to have to expend more time and resources and money actually having to find people without a license, issue a citation, go through the court system. We don't want to do all that. It's more efficient just to have people comply in the first place. And as far as issuing citations, if we didn't have to issue not one citation, as long as everybody had them, we're, we're perfectly content. So hunter education, you don't make any money there. If you wanted to be a legal boater and want to do a boater education course, Department of Fish and Wildlife aren't making any money at that either. You're just no. learning how to do what you like to do better. That's exactly. And all children want to, uh, or young adults, I should say, between 12 and 17 years of age, and want to operate a motorboat over 10 horsepower, that's a certificate that they're required to have, and there's absolutely zero charge. So in English, for that, except horse- for the online class. Okay, yeah, that basic thing. But do it online. But if it's taught in person, it's a free it's course. It's a free course. You said between 12 through 17, so if you're 18 or above, you need one? No. So 10 horsepower or more. Tell me what 10 horsepower is. Uh, that would be a small outboard motor, even electric motors. I mean, there's 9.9s for John boats. Okay. Five, five horsepower motors. So chances know, are, if you want to be on any boat of any... any there's a, a word I came up with, worth What do you think, Brian, worth <laughs> I like it. Yeah, but, <laughs> I have to look it any up. Any worthwhile <laughs> vessel, then you will need your boater education card. Yes. We're about out of time. Any last thoughts? 
purchase that license before you go afield, and uh, we hope to see you afield. Absolutely. We'd also encourage folks, uh, because we're coming up on a deadline for the 2016 elk hunt application period, resident or non-resident, to enter our elk hunt drawing. This year we'll have 910 permits awarded. So there'll be 900 general permits, 10 youth-only permits awarded by random drawing. People can apply one to four times. We have four different hunt types, depending on bull or cow, archery or firearm. And uh, that application window again closes March, or excuse me, April the 30th. The only way you can win is to enter. It's a random drawing. Everyone has the same odds. There's no preference points. Very good. Captain Skaggs and Brian Clark, drive carefully on your way home. Thank you. Same to you. Thank you. Drive carefully. No, I really don't ask people as much anymore if they text and drive at the end of the show. And here's why. They always would say no. But I'm a skeptic. Well, I hope they don't. The fact is, texting may be the leading cause of traffic accidents, but simply not paying attention, being distracted, having your head in the clouds, fooling with a a kid in the back seat, digging in the glove box for something, playing on the phone. It's not just texting. It's distracted driving. Please, pay attention. If you're listening to the show on the road, be wise behind the wheel. We are out of time. This is Charlie Bagler inviting you to join us in a week, and we'll go inside, outdoors again, right here on Kentucky Field Radio.